Hello, hello everybody. It's Kelly Folsom here. Um, if you are here, please let me know if you can hear and see me. Okay, I'm going to double check. I think everything is working. If you're here, say hello. Let me know where you're tuning in from today. I'm super excited to be painting with you again. Um, today I've got these gorgeous uh, pink roses, sort of doing like a little pink roses and tea here. Fun, fun, fun. Um, let me fix the orientation right quick. Here we go. Okay. All right, again, if you're here, let me know you're here. Give me a heart, give me a like, uh, give me a wow. <laughs> uh, and leave in the comments um, where you are tuning in from. You're welcome to paint along with me or of course watch this afterwards or just listen for inspiration while you're doing your own painting. I think we all can use quite a bit of extra inspiration these days, right? So I know I certainly can. So in an effort to continue to give back more during this holiday season and boost spirits and cheer us up, um, <laughs> I am going to be doing a series of these free demonstrations throughout the holiday season. So let me see who's here. Yay, hello. Okay, awesome. Thanks you guys, y'all rock. All right. Kelvin from Arkansas, Northeast Arkansas. Is that, a, is that important to clarify? Is there something wrong with Southwest Arkansas? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but you know how that can go in states, right? Um, hey, Deborah Mahoney, so good to see you. Yvonne from Cincinnati. Oh, it's a sunny day today in Cincinnati. Really awesome, lucky you. Yvonne Powell, okay. Oh, awesome. So many wonderful people I see are here. Hey, Phyllis Franklin. So good to see you. Yay, yay, yay. Hey, Kim from Texas. Uh, Lori, happy dance from Long Island. Yes, we need some happy dancing, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but yeah, we need like to cultivate more joy in our day-to-day -day lives these days. Uh, I've switched to doing um, some dancing workouts in the morning instead of the treadmill, which I'm sure is quite laughable if you were to see me. <laughs> but it's fun, and it definitely gets the mood started right. Okay, wonderful. Hey, Sharon. Sharon Ann, so good to see you. Fantastic. Okay, so as we are doing the demo, uh, be sure to ask me questions. I'm going to keep watch here on my tablet. Um, also, take notes live. So if something really clicks with you and connects with you, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it if you could pop that in the comments on this live video. This is gonna be a little under an hour long. We've got a lot, I don't know what the heck I was thinking, putting all of this up here for an hour demo, but we can do it, right? And we're gonna tackle it. So I'm gonna pull my hair back so it doesn't get in the way. And, okay. So I'm gonna first zoom in a little bit here so that you guys can see the setup. Okay, it's a beautiful um, silver uh, teapot pitcher. What, what is that for? It's for tea, right? And um, some lovely pink roses that I just got delivered today. Yeah, so let me just get uh, my tablet over here so I can see your comments and questions that are coming in. Hey, Debbie Nelson, so good to see you. Hi, Sarah from Saudi Arabia, that is awesome. I love, love, love all my international peeps out there. Um, I tell you what, our Vital Art Sessions crew is worldwide at this point and it's just so inspiring. See how art unifies everybody. And we all can have that in common, right? No matter where we live in the world. Love beauty, love making art, all that good stuff. So here is going to be my setup. And I'm just gonna kind of lower this down a bit. I'm gonna get you guys um, a little bit closer. Um, let me know, let's see, I think I need to shorten this a little bit. 
Maybe it would be better to raise my palette. Let me know um, how this is showing up on your view. I know that it can be a little different from device to device. Oops, I almost palette knifed myself right in the face. Let's see. There we go. That's good. From what I can see here. Okay, awesome. Gonna kind of, it's a good tip, you guys, to tilt your um, panel or canvas slightly forward if you can to cut glare. That's a big, big question I get a lot of the times is, gosh, you know, I've got so much glare. And um, the easiest thing to do is just to slightly use a, use the easel that allows you to do that where you can uh, tilt it forward. It's such a, such a relief. Okay, colors are um, my favorite white on the planet. Uh, Cremnance White from Old Holland. This is a flake white. Really, really beautiful for flowers because it's so buildable. Um, Old Holland is a little bit stiffer and it seems like this batch was especially a little bit stiff. So I'm gonna use my Marage. You could add a little bit of oil if you don't have Marage. Basically, whatever your medium is, you could just palette knife in, mix in a little bit of um, uh, oil or a little bit of medium to loosen it up a bit. Is everybody getting ready for Christmas? It's interesting, you know, as soon as December 1st hit, I was like, that's it, it's Christmas now. Uh, so I've been decorating uh, the apartment all day today. That's been a lot of fun. Having Christmas music on now that Thanksgiving is behind us, sadly. It was a wonderful Thanksgiving here in Denver, Colorado as well. Has everybody got their Christmas shopping done? I did a ton of Christmas shopping over the Black Friday sale, uh, Black Friday sales that weekend. Which is always a lot of fun. Okay, um, let's see here. I don't really know why that's doing that. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. It's so good to see you. Uh, Lynn says she's been outside stringing lights. Awesome. It's such a fun way to lift, lift our spirits celebrating the holidays. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so we've got a pretty simple left to right um, uh, composition here. Moving from left to right, I've got the picture kind of leading the eye. Uh, anytime you have a picture or anything that has a stem or a spout, uh, maybe a handle on it, something that's linear like that, you usually want to point it in the direction that you want the viewer to move towards. So we kind of start out over here um, where the little blue and white jar is, I guess. <laughs> is that what it is? The blue and white jar, that's what it is. Um, and then move up through the teapot and then curve around through the uh, final pink roses down here. Julie, so good to see you. Oh my gosh, um, I, you have no idea how much I appreciated your note um, on your order. So last weekend I had a really big Black Friday bonanza blowout extravaganza um, on my website. Uh, everything was 50% off and I just want to thank everyone who participated in that. Just means so much to me. And, you know, I kind of have this crazy idea that I would love to enter 2021 with no paintings in the studio whatsoever. For some reason to me, that just feels like it would be so freeing. <laughs> like a clean slate, just start from scratch. And um, there's, there's nothing, um, nothing quite as motivating to me than a brand new clean slate, you know, a, a brand new... Uh, yeah, brand new, brand new beginning. So I am going to have some more sales before the end of the year. And because I really have this excitement about starting 2021 with a clean slate, you might want to keep watch because there are going to be some killer, killer deals. 
um, just like the last one was. So, and if you're not in my collector circle, definitely click that link and join that. It's free to join. You will get uh, first dibs on the sales. Um, of course, there's other extra goodies that you will get as being a part of that uh, list, that collector circle list. Okay, so I'm just Tony killing the white here. I think that's critical. Um, and also I like to have a wet tone to work into, some wet, some soup to work into, I guess you might say. So I'm using a lot of my Merge uh, Burnt Umber and some Ultramarine Blue just to kind of get the ground covered. Okay, I usually like to, after I get it covered with a brush, it's just my preference, you can do it any way you want. Um, then I just like to kind of hit it with a paper towel and just kind of get rid of some of those brushstroke marks. Okay. So after I tone, then the next thing I like to do is loose very loosely. And I think this is such an important point, right? I mean, obviously everything I'm going to do is important <laughs> or else I wouldn't be doing it. But this is really a critical point because one of the biggest questions I get so often is, um, Kelly, how do I loosen up? And I think um, how you start the painting is how the painting will end up. So if you start it looser, um, your painting is more likely to end up looser in the uh, finish, right? So in other words, I'm not gonna start with, you know, a bunch of um, precise drawing stuff, you know, and then fill in the lines. So I'm not gonna sit here and agonize over getting perfect, perfect drawings. So I like to block everything in or mass everything in. It's just like a silhouette shape first. Um, and then add on, you know, more details as I go. So this really keeps me uh, loose and open, uh, able to change things or move things about or alter, uh, proportions a little bit as I go. So when working on symmetry on an object like this, I'll just kind of go side to side with my brush. And uh, then as I paint the painting, I'll be working on getting this, you know, just uh, maintaining symmetry or improving the symmetry. So I do the base first and then I like to add on the handle or the spout once I'm happy with the size of the uh, main body of the object. Hey, Laura, it's so good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Again, you know, if you guys are painting, you could just have this on as sort of some inspiration entertainment, right? It's always nice to have that. Okay, then we're gonna have this little white pot over here. And um, I'm just gonna go ahead and just anchor that down with some cast shadow underneath. You wanna anchor everything down with cast shadow and really look at what object is further back in space. The furthest object back in space is this um, picture, and uh, then the roses come out in front, right? So, and then I kind of liked how, you know, I set up these leaves to sort of form a triangle shape here. And also it kind of helps move the eye from, from this point to this point over here as well. I would say, not to say that this is the greatest composition in the world. I mean, usually these demos, it's not like I'm going to spend days masterminding a composition that's just going to uh, win the grand prize, you know. <laughs> but it is a good idea, uh, no matter, uh, you know, how much time you have for a painting, to uh, try to get a good composition because the composition uh, is so important to the overall quality of the image. So like no matter how well I would paint, uh, let's say those roses or the teapot, if I don't have a good solid and simple, really simple compositional idea, then um, you know the painting can still fall flat. So uh, there are very basic compositional ideas that you can use. And this one is just a left to right read and a triangle uh, shape. Uh, one, one book I would highly recommend checking out for ideas on that, of course, is Edgar Payne's 
composition book on, uh, it's actually for landscape work, but they're just basic fundamental compositional ideas that can uh, be translated to any genre, really. And I think landscape and still life um, are very uh, relatable. Um, it, not literally, obviously, you know, you're painting objects versus trees or clouds, but, um, but I, I would say those two are more closely related than say doing a, a still life in a portrait or a still life in a figure, you know, maybe even a figure could be very relatable to uh, landscape composition, but I digress. Okay, so after you get like your main block in started, um, and then I'll just kind of wipe out a little bit here where these roses are gonna be with my uh, marge, a little bit of marge on my paper towel, since it does have a little solvent in it. I do wanna leave some of that ground there because the ground is not super wet, but it is going to be very useful in making shadow tones and making uh, turning plane colors or grays. Um, so you don't wanna totally get rid of all of your tone underneath. You just don't want it to be super dark there or super wet, same thing on that little base. So the next thing would be get in some background color. You know, So this is where it's similar to landscape painting, those of you who are landscape artists perhaps, or, or maybe, maybe have more uh, fluency in that or more instruction in that, in that your background color is kind of like the sky color in a landscape painting. Um, so it's, it's like the color of your atmosphere, so to speak. So I'm using some ultramarine blue, um, some burnt umber again, and then a couple of my yellows, my cad yellow deep and my Naples yellow to get sort of this um, sort of earthy, you know, olivey green started. And I think it's more important to get some of this around your objects first. You don't have to get it from edge to edge and I actually recommend you don't do that. I'm gonna put in a little bit of white here just to cool it off a touch. Um, much like the sky in a landscape painting, uh, your background needs to have a little bit of coolness in it for it to recede. So if you're doing a black background, you might add some Naples yellow or a little touch of, you know, raw umber just to kind of cool it off a bit. And I actually prefer this mixture not to be the same color and temperature mixture all throughout. So like that was all getting a little solid and cool. So I kind of threw a little more yellow, cab yellow into it just to kind of warm it up. Um, and that's one way that you can get some more variety into your background color um, so that your background color doesn't look just like it's pasted on and totally separate from the objects. Now the other thing I'll do is I'll just kind of mix right into that color for um, actually just maybe some white into it. For the, the base, uh, sort of the start of the base of my tabletop color. Again, I, I just I want to get some integration here. Um, and especially in parts of the, uh, parts of the tabletop that are maybe a little closer back, especially back here. I definitely wanna have a lot of that background color. Again, just like a landscape, as things go back in space, you know, you throw in more white, more blue color of the sky to kind of connect it back. Um, and then, you know, I can start to, again, just like a landscape, start to kind of warm up this mixture uh, with some yellows or reds. So red oxide, burnt umber, uh, some Naples yellow. And again, kind of have a layering of warm over cool, cool and warm. And everything in the foreground will get, you know, kind of richer and warmer or more chromatic, more colorful as it comes forward. And I really think of my tabletop plane as part of my background. In a sense, it's really just background material. 
Okay. So it is important for me to get enough of that also established, um, just like I did in the background. Because I'm going to be able to use this color as well to kind of paint up into some of the roses and whatnot. Okay, um, I do kind of wish that I hadn't uh, used up my greenish background tone before I put some in to the teapot, but oh well. Okay, um, let's just refill some color here. Burnt umber, I think that's about it right now. So again, um, let me know if you have any questions in the comments. I can see your comments. Um, if anything really sticks with you or connects with you, um, take some virtual notes, please. That will help everybody out if you're able to. If not, that's totally understandable. Okay. Now, one thing about um, metal is that it's usually much, much darker than what you think it is. <laughs> um, so the, the local value, I would say, of metal is um, in the darker family and just put some black in there and some uh, ultramarine blue. So you kind of want to start a little bit darker and then work your way up. Silver, I think, is maybe, it, in my opinion, one of the hardest metals to paint because it doesn't really have a lot of local color to it. But one thing you also want to remember with metal is that um, it is like a mirror. Uh, to everything around it in the painting. So you're going to get all those other colors in the painting showing up. I'm not quite sure what I did there. So right now I'm starting with the darks. Again, in oil painting, you typically work uh, dark to light, okay, thin to thick, and warm to cool. Okay, and then we do have... Uh, we're just basically using red oxide, black, and cad yellow deep for some of my shadow warms here. And you do have a form shadow on the bottom of the uh, spout. I'm like, what's that called? Spout? It's amazing how your brain just kind of, <laughs> the verbal side just kind of goes, nope, not going to do it. Shutting down now. You are into the abstract other side of the brain. That's okay, we can, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll come, come and go. All right, so just pushing some of those dark accents as dark as they'll go, like the inside of the uh, teapot spout that is really going dark or perhaps like a cast shadow, basically just pushing that, um, you know, as dark as I can go. So that one thing that that does is it basically helps push this back and pull these things further, so forward more. So contrast, you know, is, is what we're after there. Um, whether it's value contrast, color contrast, or edge contrast. So I'm putting a little bit of Naples Yellow Light into that. Um, some white, sort of getting like a, a cooler, grayer mixture here for um, the light on this, or where the most light is hitting on this picture, I'm just going to kind of build that up, uh, sort of gradate, stair step it up a little bit in value, step by step. You know, a little more white, a little more uh, yellow. There's, there's quite a lot of kind of warm yellow tones in this. So I'm going to start with that. And this whole top plane you know, is all lit up. And in fact, the top plane is getting more light now, uh, than the perpendicular plane. So one thing to be really cautious of when you're painting metal is all of this can look really, really dark and you might easily start to lighten, lighten, lighten. And then before you know it, your highlight uh, is not does not have enough value contrast to the local value or local color of the object. Um, so that is one thing about uh, metal is that, you know, you have a big value contrast between uh, highlight and local color. So 
I know that the only thing on this object that should really, you know, pop uh, dynamically or dramatically is going to be these uh, notes of highlights on the metal. All right, I'm seeing a little more kind of blue, so I'm going to put in a little more ultramarine blue on parts of that. Um, so first, you know, I would say pick like whatever the base local color is, and then of course, it, as you start to see color accents, you know, definitely um, go for that. Just kind of mixing all of this together to get sort of a just a desaturated sort of. Uh, gray, but it has so much color in it, you know, uh, so many other colors in it. It's not like painting uh, just black and white, which may not really look good in the end. It might look too colorless. So I think using blue, red, and yellow or some, some variation on blue, red, and yellow is uh, definitely the way to go. All right, now I'm definitely seeing a lot of warm notes, so I'm going to add in even more red oxide, a little bit of Cad Yellow Deep. Um, if you have burnt sienna or uh, one color I really like but I'm out of right now is Avignon Orange from Mamiri Puro, very similar to that. The trick is with that with temperature shifts is that you, um, you want to keep the value the same. Okay, so you can change color, you can change temperature, but you can't change value. Now, obviously on silver, you can't just put in like a bright, straight cab red light. It's just not gonna work. But you can go from warm, get warm and cool notes in there, as long as you, um, a little more white in there, as long as you uh, keep the value very close. Another thing with painting loose is like not painting like you're filling in the lines, but you're making brush strokes, you know. And it's not that I don't ever move, add more brush strokes or touch these brush strokes further. It's just, you know, um, it's a, just a different thought process than, you know, oh, I'm going to, you know, draw all this in super tight and then. Uh, fill in the lines and stuff. So it's just a different mentality and it leads to a different end result. So that's the only important uh, part about that. Um, so if you want to paint a little bit looser or have more expressive brushwork, things like that, um, you really want to break, if you have a habit of filling in the lines, you really want to break that habit. If you love, you know, hyper realism or anything like that, then obviously you want to uh, stick with that process. It's just two different looks. You know, one is not right, one is not wrong. It's just two different um, styles of painting, really. Okay, so I am going to get some highlight on this. Probably should have already got some, but I'm just going to do some uh, Cad Lemon and some light. Okay, just to kind of see how that is popping. Actually, I'm gonna use my, I have some white over here that I haven't mixed any merge into. So it'll be a little thicker and stick a little bit more here. Or you can uh, wait a little bit for the paint to set up. The palette knife is a great tool whenever you need to get you know wet paint to stick on top of other wet paint in fact i might just build more light now that i see the highlight and see that i do have some range here to build a little more light in this section i might just use a palette knife to kind of start laying some of that light on a little bit thicker so that when it dries it doesn't you know dark uh, dry as dark And if you're using thin paint on top of, you know, thin paint, um, whatever that layer is underneath will really affect the uh, final value or the final color of what's on top of it. Okay. I think I'm going to use that brush. 
And again, this particular little teapot has a lot of warmth in it. So I'm going to put a lot more like Naples yellow, just building that path of light up the front center of the object. Took me, took me such a long time to understand that concept. You know, if you want to pull the eye into the middle. So why, why is that? Why do you want to pull the eye into the middle of the form? Any guesses? Okay, so basically just pulling more light down into there, lifting the, raising the value a little bit lighter. And then I know we're going to have, you know, a reflection of the blue and white base. I'm just going to use some ultramarine blue and white for the reflection of some of that little, what is that? It's like a little baby ginger jar and some blue. It's a nice color with the pink. And then some cab red light with some white. For some of the reflection in here. And what I'm doing here is just really kind of mixing that in with the color I already have down. So that it doesn't look, you know, too, uh, maybe too shocking. And you do want to kind of watch out, make sure that you have less impasto in the reflected lights and shadows in comparison to what you have in the light. So your lights always, the, the light part on the object, the light shape, always has more impasto. Let me check in and see if anybody answered my, took any guesses about that. Nope. Okay. So I'm loving that, loving how that pink is uh, playing out. I do also have phthalo green cool on my palette from Sennelier here. That's going to show up in some of these leaves. And I've got some of that uh, reflecting in the teapot as well. So that's going to be a really, really fun color. So things like uh, silver, you know, metals like silver, it's kind of nice to pair it with some, some brighter colors if you can, because that's kind of part of what makes silver very exciting, uh, more exciting than, you know, if you just had like silver with, I mean, that could be beautiful too, but I, I tend to like um, silver with other colors, brighter colors. So just reinforcing some of the cast shadow underneath that lid. Okay, awesome, Lori. So, um, why do we want to act, accentuate the center of the form? Um, I was trying to give you guys time to take a stab at that, but um, I'll just tell you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, definitely, Lori, that's fantastic. She's writing notes. And again, if you don't have a notepad handy, you could definitely write it in the comments here too. Because when you write things down, you know, it definitely uh, helps to cement it a little bit more. It, you know, it gives your brain a little more Velcro to stick to. And, uh, you know, it's often said we have to hear things seven, seven different ways or seven different times. Uh, for something to really stick. I'm, I'm not quite sure if I think that's true, but I'm not sure where I heard that from. Um, but I've definitely found it to be true in my development that, you know, sometimes you're just also not ready for a piece of information. You just can't even comprehend it artistically yet. Um, it's, it's like, okay, you're still you're still in kindergarten and so you can't really, or maybe you're in uh, third grade or fourth grade and so you can't understand sometimes concepts that are on a, um, 
you know, uh, high school level, you know, for example. You would never expect a kindergartner or an elementary school student to go into school and all of a sudden understand algebra, you know. So, so I think the reason why I'm saying that is not to be condescending at all, but to, uh, I just think it's important to understand that idea because I, I do, I, I know I experienced this as a student and I have seen it so much uh, over my, you know, how many years have I been teaching? Like eight or nine years? That it's it's kind of like this misconception that, oh, I'm, it's gonna be easy and I'm just gonna hop in there and just get after it, you know? Uh, and, and then what happens is we can just beat ourselves up too much or think we're stupid or something if we don't understand something yet. And um, it, it's just, it's just, it's just not gonna happen. You know, you have to kind of start, you have to understand first some of the basic concepts before you can grasp, grasp some of the higher uh, ideas. Okay, so you really have to have a heck of a lot of patience uh, if you wanna learn uh, to be a fine artist and uh, with yourself and with everybody else. Um, okay. Let's see. Yes, thank you, Susan, Guthrie. Good, good, good. Uh, and Isabel, Oliver, both are chiming in uh, with an answer about the why, why do we want to kind of activate the front center of the form? And so Susan has said because it is the light source, and yes, that is correct. Tells us the direction of the light source, so that is super important, and it's important to only have one light source. And then Isabel says the light in the center is to give the illusion of roundness. And um, so that is uh, definitely the main point, you know, so, so both of those points are good. Um, but what, in oil painting, one of the ways that we create more illusion of three-dimensionality and depth is by pulling the eye more towards the part of the form that is closest to us, right? Because everything that we're trying to do is trying to make this two-dimensional flat panel look like it's more 3D. You know, it's all just a magic trick. And so thicker paint, uh, building up thicker paint, more specific brush strokes, a highlight, and the highlight is the, the ultimate of all of that, right? Like more texture in the middle or something. All of that is going to pull the eye more towards the center, which then in turn makes these um, contours that are further away from us recede more. Uh, it's, it's just an illusion, you know, just, it's just how our, we're just kind of fooling the eye because that's how our eye works, you know? Um, look here, don't look there, you know, sort of thing. So, um, okay. So awesome, good guys. Or girls, gals, ladies. All my ladies. We've got some um, super smart ladies in the house today. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the center of some of these roses, just with some cad red light and some white. Actually, I'm gonna put a little touch of red oxide in there, warm it up a little bit more. Okay, and then on this one, and I'm gonna use some of my background color just to kind of desaturate that a bit, kind of get like this sort of mauve sort of like a cool mauve gray. And you can also steal some color from the background if you want a little more green in the mix. So I did choose like a greenish tone background with this because it would be the complementary color to the pink roses. And then we don't want um, floating objects, right? Uh, so we definitely have to come back in and kind of ground down uh, with some cast shadow underneath. Okay. So now I'm gonna take mostly white, just the tiniest bit of cab red light. Uh, for the light part of this flower. Okay. And then a little more cab red light for the uh, inside of the flower, but it's, you know, it's not the, the total 
depth shadow of the flower. So usually on your flowers, the very inside is the warmest or the, uh, uh, yeah, like the warmest and most intense in color. Okay, these outer petals, as you can see, go, you know, get really washed out generally. So we've got this one that's kind of curving away from the form that's got a lot of light into it. And one thing about roses, especially lighter colored petals, lighter colored roses, is that there's a translucency to them. So that's where I like to use, you know, some background color to kind of get that sort of grayish tone, or I can add in some yellow as well to kind of go a little bit warmer here. But you kind of ha have to have cool and warm and sort of a gray, gray tone color to get that sense of um, translucency. Yes, Hedda, that is correct. This is the part of the form that's actually closest to me. Um, the contours are further away from me. Hey, Rebecca from Australia. So good to see you. I'm going to push this value a little bit darker here with some ivory black on the shadow side of this metal. And I need some uh, green leaves. So I think um, this is an interesting situation because the green leaves are very close in value to the background. Um, and, you know, it's also similar in color, so it's, it's not a terrible uh, thing, but it might be a little bit of a challenge to get the green leaves to stand out. I'm going to try a couple of different ideas here. I see a cast shadow on this one green leaf over here. There's also a cast shadow uh, of this leaf on top of the other leaf. So I'm going to push that darker with some ivory black and cad yellow deep to get a cast shadow color. Also some cast shadow on this back end of the leaf. Um, that is, you know, the, the teapot is casting a shadow on it in that one, in that case. Okay, um, but so that, as you can see, that creates a contrast and also I purposefully created a little bit of a harder edge there. Um, so I'm gonna see, okay, what, what if I just, let's just go for the color, some uh, phthalo green cool, some cad yellow deep. Um, so I, I kind of don't mind some of that being a little more mysterious, those leaves but um, it'll be interesting to see what I might have to do to get them to pop a little bit more where I want them to pop more. So I think I'm gonna have to go lighter, either that or I need to take the background lighter, one of the two. And um, so you can try it both ways and see what works. I think one, one thing that often gets maybe misunderstood is that the background is set, you know, like it is, can't be changed, you know, <laughs> the value, the color, it can't be, or, or even the value and color of this can't be changed. So it's, um, you know, reality is not set in stone. Um, so you can, uh, make your call as to, you know, just aesthetically what you like. I think I'm actually going to go for a richer green here and then take the background a little lighter. So, um, I'm going to try that. And again, it's painting. So if I decide later on that I don't like that or something about that solution doesn't maybe work as well, then I can always, you know, take it back. But um, so I think having that understanding, though, and getting yourself out of the mindset of, say, just color matching is actually quite freeing because it frees you up to be able to just kind of pay attention to what's actually happening on your canvas and just listening to your canvas, basically. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, just to kind of pop that one a little bit more, I'm gonna lighten up the background a bit. Some Naples yellow, ivory black and white. Definitely still want that green sensation though, so might put a little bit of ultramarine blue in there. 
I don't often have both blues out at the same time, but this is one of those paintings that I think uh, definitely benefits from both temperatures of blue, the, the more purple blue of the um, ultramarine and then the more intense blue. And again, the whole background doesn't have to go this color. It can definitely just be more of this value and color down here and then um, kind of dissipate into the other color, you know. So um, again, I think the most important part there is just to recognize that uh, this is your painting and uh, as long as everything, as long as these look like leaves and that makes sense as a background, you know, there's some flexibility there. Okay. Kind of pull some of this down. And once I do that, I do like to just kind of, you know, make sure that that, I kind of smooth some of that transition stuff out so that it's not super noticeable. And carving out with your background color and other paint is is really an import, important skill to hone. And you can't be afraid of the paint and afraid of the brush to, to hone it, you know. So um, you have to take a chance of ruining something. Um, you will, you know, basically develop more adept brush handling over time if you allow yourself to. You know, if you make, you know, uh, intentional, bold, strokes. So carving out with the brush is one of the ways uh, in which we can do that as artists. Okay. While I've got that on my brush, I think this could use a little more uh, background color. especially now that I've gone a little bit cooler in that background. Um, so the two blues are ultramarine blue, and actually this isn't a blue at all, phthalo green cool, um, but it's very blue green. So since my little bitty baby palette is covered in paint, let's get it scraped up. Let me know if anybody has any questions that I can answer for you. Okay. Gonna need a little bit more white, I think for those roses. And what I'm doing right now is just really pulling any of that paint out of my brush with my Viva paper towel. Okay. All right. I'm going to start with this kind of greenish gray color down here, but I'm going to add in some cab red light just to get a neutral for some of these shadow planes. So as you can see, it looks very kind of violet or purple. If that's going a little too cool, you can add in a little bit more of the uh, red oxide. Um, basically, if any mixture maybe is looking a little too cool, I'll add in something warm, essentially, to warm it up, whether that's a red oxide or a cab yellow deep. So there's some shadow, uh, shadow edges here on this rose. Okay, and then we go back to light on the rose. Might need to switch to a different size brush. This is a size two, but might even need something smaller. So this has um, back to my cab red light and white mixture. I'm 
this time I'm using whatever that thickest, thickest um, white is without the medium in it, just to get more body to the paint up here in the foreground. Definitely gonna have to switch to something smaller. Um, so Kim is asking how long does it take until it dries? Um, usually with Kremnitz White and the Mirage, it only takes a few days to dry. So, and then I like to use um, uh, Windsor & Newton Artist Gloss Varnish is what my preference is. So maybe like a week later, might varnish it. I don't wait six months. especially since I'm using a speed dryer. Okay, so I added in some Cad Lemon um, with that Cad Red in white, a lot of white here, to get the most lit up petals. And I wanna kind of create a sharper edge on those petals that are most lit up. So sharp edge on the outside, soft edge on the inside. So start your stroke more firm and crisp on the um, outside of the petal and then lift, lift off on the inside. And if you pick up, you know, some of that green, that's totally okay. Again, those outer petals have a lot more uh, appearance of translucency because they're further away from the, from the body of the rose. So, there's a lot of warmth in here on this fold of this petal. Lots of yellow, warm glow, uh, light passing through. So transmitted light tends to be warmer, light passing through something like a piece of glass or a grape. So you definitely want to, um, you know, make sure you get a little more warmth where you have transmitted light happening. Even reflected light can be a little cooler depending on you know, what's causing the reflected light. So reflected light is caused by another object, um, you know, basically impacting another object. So let's see, I think that went way too cool. Let me warm that back up. And then light passing through, uh, the physical light passing through does tend to be on the warmer, on the warmer temperature side, uh, pretty regularly. So, and obviously, it's just kind of a short-handed, shorthand version of how to paint roses. Um, these roses, in particular, are much more. Um, I would say rectangular. They're not quite as round and spherical. Some are much more round. Um, these are much more kind of cubic in their construction. So it's a little bit easier to see their um, plane changes. And now I see that that needs to come up higher that petal as it's breaking away from the rose. And just going a little bit darker with some red oxide and some uh, cab red light, even a little alizarin might be nice just for the very center of this rose. Again, just to kind of reestablish that. Same thing over here for the very center of that rose. And then if you ever do have anything that kind of needs to be wiped away, you can just use your paper towel just to pull some of that paint off because there is another um, little petal over here. Um, you know, with silver, Carol has a good question about what other color of roses would work. You know, with silver, I think red is really, you know, a deep ruby red is really beautiful. Uh, 
probably with a lighter, a lighter background in that case. Um, and then yellow is really pretty with silver. You could pair that with, with blues or with purples um, or just do, you know, yellow and silver. So um, silver is pretty, mal you know, you can put silver in a lot of different context that can go warmer it can go cooler in this case it's you know more of uh, maybe a cooler tone all these kind of more pastel colors like pinks and greens and blues and whatnot and my roses have grown so much it's hilarious that's what happens when you're painting fast and talking at the same time they've just gotten bigger and bigger so it's another good <laughs> point to bring up that um, it's, a, you know, I think uh, wise to start them, start your flowers smaller. And it's also easier to paint them bigger. So if you're just getting started painting flowers, I would definitely, you know, grab some bigger canvases <laughs> because they're definitely easier to paint on a larger scale because they just, you know, they there's so much detail on them and they do have a tendency to want to go bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, as you're painting. So painting it on a little eight by 10 is um, still a bit of a challenge for me. Even at this stage, it's like, oh my gosh, they just keep getting bigger. So many little petals I wanna do and they're so tiny. And, you know, as far as choosing a color, um, oops, that was too dark. So one thing definitely want to watch out for is sometimes in the center, it's easy to go way too dark. And that was way too dark. So you can just put a new light in the mixture and put a new brushstroke, make the same brushstroke you made on top of it, you know, um, because that is something that I do see happens a lot people's paintings is that they just take the inside way, way too dark. Um, I mean, the overall value of this rose is pretty light in value. So it's just, you know, kind of maybe a little bit difficult to uh, maintain the value range because, you know, there's just so many details. So one thing that can be helpful too is again, make sure you push your cast shadows um, to the degree that they need to go dark enough so that the rose then, uh, you know, it just makes sure you get enough contrast there, essentially. There's a little negative shape there of cast shadow in between the rose and the break of that petal. Oops, Alexa, stop. If I don't set those timers, I'll have no clue how far along I am. <laughs> but as you can see, just pushing that uh, dark there um, really does help, you know, to make that rose kind of pop out more to the eye. Oh, so back to um, what I was saying, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. But um, back to what I was saying about, um, as far as like what colors go together, um, I think that is something important that you, you know, you do start to learn over time. You know, basically kind of like don't put, you know, pastel colors with, you know, orange, a, a bright citrus orange or, uh, you know, earth tones. So like earth tones and pastel tones tend to clash quite a bit. Um, other than that, you know, kind of deciding on different color schemes that's kind of where either taking a color scheme from a painting that you really love, you know, maybe let's say if you, you love a Van Gogh, you know, that Van Gogh sunflower painting with all the, the yellows and the greens and the golds. If you love, if you love that color scheme, I would just say, you know, take that color scheme and do your own painting with those colors. You know, maybe it's not sunflowers, but maybe it's roses or, you know, something else. I always like to let some of this light kind of spill out and some of the color as well, especially right in front of the object. 
So if, if things in your painting are not looking, uh, you know, if it's not really look, feeling lighted, but let's say maybe you painted, painted something as light as it can go, um, or as bright as it can go, but it's still maybe not feeling lighted, you definitely wanna look at, have you let that light spill out and spread around? Because if you haven't, that's probably why it doesn't feel uh, lighted in the end result. So that could be through reflections, it could be through, you know, just getting some glow around something that's lit up, or even uh, the most overlooked is letting it spill out into uh, the background or into the tabletop. All right, I gotta get off this rose for a minute. So um, I'm gonna go over here to this leaf on the tabletop plane with some phthalo green cool, some cad lemon, and some white. I need something easy to do right now. <laughs> I think as a painter too, um, you know, make sure you are kind of pacing that energy. Um, and some of us have more concentration power than others. I'm definitely not one of those. Um, it has gotten better with time, but um, so, but there will come a point where you start to get diminishing returns, you know, so if you start to feel yourself banging your head against the wall on something, it's, it's probably best just to take a break from it, uh, whether that's taking a break from the painting as a whole or moving to something simpler, you know, to kind of refresh your focus. I'm sure you guys, I'm sure you guys know that and um, have felt that before. Okay, so I'm gonna use some Cad Lemon. Kind of using Cad Lemon in anything with white on anything that's getting hit with light. You know, I think it, when you do things like that, it just kind of creates a cohesion in the painting, a connection between objects. <laughs> this little thing needs to grow so much because my roses got so big. Um, uh, but it, you know, you're, you're basically aware that you are creating a visual thing, you know? So um, it's different than just copying reality. And there's certain ways to create more uh, harmony and balance and uh, cohesion in a painting. And I think, so you, you look for ways to do that. And I think one of those ways that I, I know I've definitely stumbled upon or somehow the the painting gods from above said we're we're gonna allow you to see this <laughs> and that is you know basically having you know a similar vein of color or temperature in uh all of the uh lights you know all of the objects whether that's literally having you know a similar color you know, or if it's just, you know, same kind of color that you're mixing into all of your, your uh, light patterns, I guess you would say. a little stem here which is kind of nice to maybe get that overlap not sure if I love that or not but I'll try it could be a nice lead-in we've got this overlapping in front of the leaves that's definitely nice it's a it's still a green but it's kind of a different variation on that green so again, it's, it's like it's bringing in cohesion, but also variety. Same thing on this one over here, although this one is not fully formed whatsoever, this rose. Um, okay. And oh, I should say that it's kind of a good point to maybe bring up on uh, these roses in general is maybe looking for a little variety, whether that's a variety in shape in color, you know, maybe maybe this one has a little more yellow on it than the ones down below. But I do think with leaves, it can be a challenge uh, because you can make them kind of all the same. And 
uh, then it just looks too flat and boring. And actually, I kind of want to put some red into this green. I'm going to make this one a little bit bigger. Again, just to kind of connect the color, color world there. And doing that, I lost my cast shadow from the leaf up above, which is part of what popped that leaf forward from the background. So is the cast shadow on it? Just bring that back in. Again, yeah, make sure your, your shadows stay kind of um, flat, flatter, you know, not quite so much impasto or thick, thickness of brush stroke or paint. Sometimes I'll go with a form like that and then come back across the form again with my brush. Again, just kind of looking for um, some more variation in this particular leaf. This is another area where I can definitely kind of, I'm totally out of my maples, the yellow there. But basically, this might be an area too where I can kind of change the background color or throw some, throw some shadow onto the background there just to pop that, that one leaf again. I don't really like to put any color, you know, isolated by itself. So usually try to kind of spread it around somewhere else or integrate it somewhere else. Again, just for that cohesion. Okay, shadow on white. Let's get to that. Hey, Elaine. Hey, Laura. Yeah, this will be posted afterwards. Um, Laura, so if you have to skedaddle, then go for it. So shadow on white, basically red, blue, and yellow again together. I'm going to put more of my cadmium red in it for some glow there. You can also use background color in white in this case. And I'm actually going to do a little bit of both. Basically, shadow on white, you, you don't want it to be brown. You don't want it to just look black and white like it's just gray. Um, so there needs to be some colors in the mix, much, much like the uh, uh, teapot, the silver teapot. So anything neutral in a painting, I think it still has to have some flavor of color to it. There's a little cast shadow on that foot there. And then let's uh, put some pattern on there. I mean, this is going to be the easiest thing to paint in this whole shebang. Um, just some ultramarine blue and white. And the reason why I say it's going to be easy is because the pattern um, just creates so much form. Maybe I should knock on wood if I say that. That sounds really bad. This is going to be so easy. I remember a day when this would have made me quit my entire career painting this little blue and white thing. So I take that back. I take it back. I take it back. Don't strike me down, gods, <laughs> gods of painting. <laughs> okay, and then dar a darker blue in the shadow mixture. basically watching to curve that pattern with this side of the contour and then this side of the pattern curves the opposite direction to get more form. And then pretty much all we need on that then, you know, to finish that up is the highlights. So a little highlight. I like to put it on the blue so I'll actually kind of sit and play with my object sometimes and you know kind of twist and turn it to get the highlight maybe on top of blue because it's easier to paint than highlight on top of 
white up here. <laughs> so that's a little that's a little sneak rit. A little sneak rit you can know is um, you know, I mean, but I think it's really true, like a lot of times painting is just finding ways to make your job a little bit easier to create that illusion. Um, so, you know, I, I've seen that happen in so many workshops I've taught where somebody will set something up and I'm like, well, you know, dang, I don't even know if I could do that, you know? Um, and if you just turned your apple this way, it would be so much easier to paint. Or if you just positioned your roses that way, you know, it's, it's gonna be easier to paint them. Um, a little bit of red and white in there for reflection from the roses. Okay, um, so just things like that along the way that you do begin to learn. And um, you also start to, I think as you develop, you start to take off some of the pressure of, because when that stuff happens, when we're, when we're learning, we tend to think, oh, it's because I'm not good enough. You know, I'm not talented enough or skilled enough or, you know, whatever you want to, whatever you might say in your own mind. But um, as you start to study, you know, master artist works and you gain more maturity as an artist, you kind of start to figure out, oh, you know, that was just maybe not a smart way to, to light the subject or, you know, maybe that was just gonna be really difficult to make that work in a painting, period. So for example, if you have a, uh, like a, a, a red and yellow apple, it's usually a little easier to put the red more in shadow and the yellow more in light because it's just easier to make, to make um, yellow look lit up and red is a, a darker value. So, you know, you just kind of see things like that over time, like, oh, okay, that would be a lot easier to do it that way. And it still looks like an apple and it's beautiful and it's not just, it's just not such a, um, a headache, you know, to do it. Okay, so I need a few more hits of light on this rose. And you know, roses that are laying down on the ground, it's really important that you try to get them kind of flat on the ground you know, because they're getting squashed by the weight. The weight of themselves is kind of pushing down. So they're rounder on top and flatter on the bottom. So you want to make sure you don't make this bottom too round. You kind of want to flatline it a bit. Um, and again, if you don't flatline it, then you'll start to get that floating object uh, syndrome which is a really nasty disease. You don't want to get that. <laughs> no UFOs, no UFOs. We draw, we draw a line in the sand on UFOs. No more will we have these ungrounded floating objects. Thank you very much. So that was all getting so complicated in there and I've kind of moved this rose around so much that it was just going to be easier for me just to kind of flatten it all out again and kind of start in that center you know kind of start start from scratch again so um, I prefer to do that rather than scrape it off to tell you the truth so um, there's really no reason to start over it's just you know kind of flatten it out with your brush tie all the colors together remove some of the brush strokes and then you kind of have this clean slate again to start from. So the other thing of course is whatever direction the light source is coming from, that is the side of the petals um, that are going to cup, hold the light more. So that's, those are the petals that you want to kind of have uh, lighter value on and then basically I'm just sharpening up all my edges here you know naturally a lot of time if you're painting looser you know your edges tend to um, 
you know, get very soft and when you're painting wet into wet, especially. I don't want to get something kind of purpley eventually, but um, so a lot of times towards the end of the painting, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing is kind of sharpening up edges. Um, a lot of people have the, the opposite thing that they have to do because they started the painting, you know, meaning they have to go through and soften edges because they've started the painting really sharp and cut out, you know, so they might have to, they might actually have to, you know, soften edges. But for me, most of the time, because I start so loose, uh, most of the time what I have to do is go through and sharpen up some edges to finish. Um, so, you know, in doing it around places of importance, like, you know, this petal here, we need a little more contrast in general around it. So uh, I can get some value contrast and I can also, you know, get um, some, some edge contrast as well. And you, I want to have enough hard edges up here because this is, you know, in the foreground and is um, kind of my star of the show here. A little more red in there for some more glow. So warm colors are going to feel more glowy. Um, so you definitely want to use use those warmer tones like the red oxide or even some alizarin crimson or some cab red light where you need a, a little feeling of more glow. Okay, everybody. Um, let me see uh, if we have any questions. Hey, Lisa, yeah, this is going to be posted right after I get off here. Uh, Marty, so good to see you. Yay. Flat bottoms on roses, done. Good, Phyllis, that's awesome. Um, you know, Kim is asking about these brushes. Are they fairly stiff? I mean, they're hog hair brushes, so I guess they're stiffer than like a sable or something like that. Um, but the reason why I like these Silver Grand Prix or the Robert Simmons Signet brushes is because and, and, and they're, they're, I should say, they're just kind of regular length filberts. Um, and so there's enough flexibility there that, um, you know, you can get some softness. And then of course, as the paint starts to set up, like basically you, you might be doing a painting where you're working on it for, you know, several hours. So, um, or maybe at least a couple of hours, not just an hour or 30 minutes, but, um, it, you know, when that's the case, the paint will start to set up more and it won't really matter so much if your brush is a little stiffer. But, and also I should say too, it's just developing, you know, like a lighter uh, pressure and painting with your arm and not your wrist is part of that, you know totally don't have this symmetrical, but let's see if we can work that out. So just looking side to side there, it's a little bit better. And, you know, for symmetry too, turning it upside down or using like a mirror. A mirror is good in general, um, especially whenever you're starting out because it's kind of hard for you to see how everything is working or not working um, in the painting. I guess I don't like that little stem after all. So uh, checking your work in a mirror is, uh, I, I wouldn't get too addicted to it, but um, I just have a big mirror in the studio. I don't have like a little pocket mirror. I know a lot of artists do that, but I feel like that gets so addictive to where you're just like checking every Every time you make a change or make a brush stroke, you're checking. But, you know, I would say if, you, if you're working for an hour uh, or two, then you can kind of check in a mirror and just see how everything is progressing and if anything needs, um, you know, uh, adjusting, basically. What was that saying? So there's some saying about a painting is just a series of adjustments. <laughs> I think I could, you know, maybe buy that. 
Um, and, and yeah, and I think it's more of an open, an open mentality, you know, which I prefer. I prefer it to be, you know, subject to change, open, uh, within reason, you know, obviously you don't want to be, uh, once it's done, it's done. I mean, I am kind of the queen of letting go once a painting is done. Um, I can let go of it really easily. Even if I see things that later on, I never feel the urge to um, open a painting back up, so to speak. If it's varnished, it's framed, I don't ever feel the urge to um, go back into it, you know. So if anything, I might try that idea again, you know, uh, several years later, if I see something, oh my gosh, I see now, I, I, I should have done this or, or I'd like to try that. But um, yeah, so, so I like to stay open while I'm working on the painting, but um, I also like to um, work to the finish and not work um, just in a circle, you know, so I am just moving to the finish line and uh, you may not be that way and that's okay, you know, but that's definitely the way that I work and I, I think it has definitely helped my development because um, uh, I've completed so many paintings, you know, and I do think you learn from every painting that you complete, but if you continue, you know, if you're just always trying to perfect this one painting or you're taking three months, you know, two months, uh, even two weeks, you know, to complete a painting, sometimes I feel like, well, you're probably not going to you're probably not going to get better as quickly because this is a physical activity. And um, if you can repeat the steps over and over again, many, many times, you know, it just ingrains it in you and you start to see, see more things that way than trying, rather than trying to get it all in one painting. I hope that makes sense. So just trying to create a little bit more mystery over here by using some background color to eliminate some of this warmth on this side and also just kind of walked it into the perpendicular plane of this teapot here. Okay, all right everybody, I think that that is all I have time for today. Um, oh gosh, I see a bunch of comments I missed, I'm so sorry. Um, wow, how did I miss all these? Wow, you guys, thank you so much, Carol. Um, oh, you did pink roses. Um, <laughs> you did pink roses recently. All right. Um, yeah, yellow would be good with this too, yellow roses. Or like I said, red roses with maybe a lighter um, background. So let me kind of zoom in on the painting here for you guys. Um, so if you want to take a screenshot and then paint along with this, uh, video afterwards you could take a screenshot of that of sort of the finished demo so to speak I'll give everybody a moment to do that um, let's see Michelle's asking me could I have made the uh, uh, silver the star of the show you know yeah it's possible I think with a different size and placement you know, um, meaning, you know, the roses right now are on the right hand side and the picture is leading up to it. So I think with a different, different positioning, sure, the teapot could, you know, definitely end up being the star of the show. I don't see why not. Um, you know, it just all is a matter of where you place things and how you place it, position it. Um, that's why your size and placement and your composition is so important. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody, wonderful. I'm gonna see what else I missed here on comments. Um, awesome, Lisa, yes, it feels so good to just like move forward. You, you know, you got what you're gonna get out of that painting that day, you learned what you were gonna learn, and then you take what you learned to the next painting too, so. Hey, Catherine, good to see you. Yeah, this will be posted, guys, um, so, uh, I am going to get on a regular schedule with this. Uh, I just haven't decided what day and what time for sure. But um, this will be a weekly thing and I will um, keep you guys uh, alerted to that 
yeah, hopefully better in the future. This is just kind of impromptu. So thank you, Bobby. It's so good to see you. I hope that you, um, yeah, I hope that you're having a good start to your holiday season with your family and, um, yeah, good to see you. I hope all is well with you. Uh, Marlene, you're so welcome. It's my pleasure. Just going through to see. I missed all oh, so many comments. I don't know what happened here. Um, okay. All right. I think that's it. So I'm going to also put this on the, uh, the actual still life. If you want to take a screenshot of that so that you can paint from it. Um, let's see. Yeah, that should be. I'll kind of get a little bit more at the angle I was at. Just kind of a little more at an angle. So if you guys want to screenshot that, go for it. Um, I just kind of get this out of the way. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. Yeah. And uh, feel free to, you know, tag me in those posts if you want to. Um, all that good stuff. Oh, be sure to also like my page or follow follow this page too, please. Pretty please with sugar on top. I'd appreciate it so much. Just help helps me to, to get um, my stuff seen in the feed. Which way should I go? <laughs> this way. Okay. All right, everybody. That was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that it was helpful to you and enjoyable and all that good stuff. Um, just to let you know, this painting will be available in my next sale. So if you're interested in um, having this painting or some of my artwork as your very own, I have a lot more holiday sales coming up around the corner. Super, super excited about those. The next one is actually going to be a buy one, get one free sale. Yay! So there's a link here to join the collector circle for free um, if you are interested in doing that. If not, no worries. Um, just want to make sure that you're aware of that because you will get first dibs on uh, notifications on sales and also some extra deals that public people in the public don't get. So you can join that there. And didn't sign this so sometimes whenever I'm doing demos or plein air sketches I'll just use like a barbecue skewer stick to actually sign my name into the paint it's a quick way to sign okay everybody I am sending you all so much love and um, I hope you all are having a beautiful beginning to your uh, holiday season. Also, just so you know, I have a new blog post up on kellyfolsom.com. Um, it's my tips to getting through a Christmas with COVID <laughs> or a COVID Christmas, which is a terrible thing to call it. But um, if you're interested in reading that, you can hop over to kellyfolsom.com and read the blog there. If you are not already a Vital Art Sessions member, um, you can go to artlifewithkelly.com and there are some uh, video series there that you can purchase. Um, there is a free uh, video subscription as well called Intro to Art Life. You'll see it underneath the instructions tab. Again, that's only if you're not a current Vital Art Sessions member. Vital members do not sign up for that. You already have all of you have everything that's in the free subscription already. So, um, but if you are not a vital member and you're looking for some more instruction like this, go and sign up to intro to art life at www.artlifewithkelly.com and you will get instant access to those lessons. Um, what else do I need to tell you about? I guess that's it. Um, oh, Vital Art Sessions will be opening for enrollment January 1st. So if you're interested in joining our amazing community worldwide, and it is truly an incredible one. I just love everybody in there to pieces, and I love watching everybody progress in there. So if you're interested in joining that, you will get notified of open enrollment if you're on that free uh, free video subscription that I just mentioned, Intro to Art Life at artlifewithkelly.com. So, yeah. Okay, everybody. 
Let me see if there's any final questions before I um, line up, sign off. Hey, JoLynn, thank you so much. You're so sweet. Yay. Okay, good. So, JoLynn, this is going to be posted and you can um, watch it at your convenience. Okay, everybody, much love and wishing you all happy, happy and healthy holidays. Bye.